watching this, and I'm, I'm a football fan, so I'm, I'm well aware of what's going on with the team. I found it fascinating that when we go against tradition, when we go against custom, it causes people to look deeper and make and, and add meaning, maybe more than should be there. So when, when, when we go against something that's customary, something that's, that's traditional, all of a sudden you hear other comments. Well, this must mean you don't love the president. This must mean you don't love America. This must mean you don't love our military uh, men and women. This must mean you don't love the police force. This, so, the, so one instance where a gentleman went against a custom of the country and all of a sudden, every other thing must apply. It was a symbolic gesture. Standing for a flag is, is a symbolic gesture. And I don't know about you. And I don't know where you stand. If you've heard about this controversy, and it is a, it is a controversy, um, you may fall on one side or another you'll agree that it's a symbolic gesture. Um, I actually find traditions to be very helpful. I, I find traditions to be um, useful. I, I don't think you could go to any country, I don't think you could, could go to any land, in fact, where you find people and not find a tradition. I'm gathering that there are a number of homes here represented. If I went into any of your homes, be you a home of six or a home of one, if I walked into your home, I would find that there are certain things that are customary, certain things that are traditional. Would you say that, amen to that? When you come into my home, one of my traditions is I take off my shoes in the house. I can't help it. If I go to someone else's home, they may say, no, 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 it's no big deal. You don't need to take off your shoes. And I still take them off because I don't feel right. And I'm a, if, you, if you know anything about me, I'm allergic to cats and dogs. And I've gone into homes, and I know they have a cat, and I know they have a dog. And yet, and if I take off my shoes, I'm going to get cat hair and dog hair all over my socks. But I would rather deal with the cat hair on my socks than have shoes. That tradition is something that is a, is a tangible way to bind generations. I think it's an actual way in which you can you can allow an older generation and a younger generation to meet. And in and, and many homes, if, if an older generation and a younger generation, if there are some differences, tradition can help bring them together. You say, well, this is how we traditionally do things. And tradition can, can bind the glue. And in fact, I think that you will find sometimes that Satan works best when he can find a way to chip away at a tradition. If he can find a way to chip away at a tradition that that's actually the binding link between generations, then all of a sudden, away at traditions. But you know, Jesus himself had to deal with some traditions. And Jesus himself took issue with some traditions. If you have your Bible with you, open to the book of Bibles in the pews, I believe it's on page 975, but we're going to look at the book of Mark chapter 7, and we may even get it up here on the, on the screen if, if, if we find it. Uh, we're going to read from Mark chapter 7. We'll read through this, and then we'll come back to it again later. I just want to set the scene for the story. So Mark chapter 7, and we're starting from verse 1. 
And I'm, I'm going to be reading from the uh, New International Version. It's a little bit different than the version that we may have for the Word of the Lord. Can you have a say, amen? So the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem, they gathered around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to the human, onto human traditions. And he continues. You have a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what that, what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. You notice Jesus doesn't seem too thrilled with these traditions. Jesus doesn't seem enamored with, with these traditions that they have. In fact, it, when, when I read it, I get the sense, if, and I don't know if you got the sense, but I got the sense that, that Jesus was a little irritated. I mean, he called them hypocrites as though it were their last name. He, he, he was a little bothered, and, I, and I, the only way I think we can maybe understand why he was bothered, it wasn't so much the question, why aren't they washing their hands? It was the context of their question. See, see it, it's one thing to say, well, you know, they were asking Jesus. It almost seems like maybe Jesus was too harsh in his well, they just asked the question. Why aren't they obeying the tradition? We have a tradition of the elders. Why aren't they obeying it? And Jesus just lashes into them. You hypocrites. And then he starts saying, you got a fine way of laying aside the commandments of God. I mean, he just, he just goes, it's as if he's been waiting to say something. And the only way I think you understand it is if you understand the context in w with which they presented the question. So if you're still there, if you're still there in Mark chapter 7, turn over to Mark chapter 6. Let's look at the end of Mark chapter 6. You shouldn't have too much to flip over. And it's actually almost impossible to read <laughs> on this front. It says, Mark chapter 6, and we're going to start from verse 53 says, when they had crossed over, talking about Jesus and the disciples, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran through the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever he went, into villages, towns, and countryside. They placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were, were, were healed. That's fascinating. I, I mean, just for a minute, I mean, put yourself in, in that town. I mean, we have a, some people here, and, I, and I'm sure everyone here has some ailment that you would love Jesus to take care of. Everyone here has something that, that in your heart, you know, it's like, man, I wish, you know, I don't want to keep going back to the doctor. I don't want to keep going back to the dentist or, or this type of doctor or that. I wish I could get someone to give me a cure. And they had it. And he was walking through their region. And, it, and the Bible says, 
says that, that everywhere he went, they just pulled people out en masse and said, you've got to get there, you've got to get there. Jesus is over here, let's go. If you want to know like, what God feels about you, how God is concerned with your own personal life and your circumstances and your situation, just consider the fact that, that God was showing himself through Christ. And when not hindered by man, God was showing healing. Everywhere he went, nobody not healed. Mental healness, me mental healings, physical healings, every single type of healing that was possible was being done, being seen. God loves so much, and Jesus is going through, and he's allowing it to happen to the extent that he didn't even need to really address you. He didn't have to put his hands on you. You simply had to touch the hem of his garment. What would you do to have that? But that's the same God we serve today. Now, I imagine, I, I mean, I, I, I imagine, you, you, I mean, you could empty out hospitals, nursing homes, young homes, mental homes. You could empty out say, ah, we don't need that. We, you close the pharmacies up. We've got someone with a cure. He has a cure. And so it's, it's on the heels of everyone being healed. People being converted. People seeing sicknesses, things that they hadn't been able to get rid of, things that the doctors hadn't even been able to diagnose, and they're seeing these sicknesses be healed. Now imagine you're Jesus, and even just for a minute. Imagine now you're Jesus, and you're seeing the same healings. You're happy to see the healings, and all of a sudden, here comes Mark chapter 7. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. on hand washing. I mean, if you can just imagine for a minute all of the, I mean, somebody who's been a leper or someone who's been lame since birth, all of a sudden they're walking and their skin is right and someone comes and says, but you didn't wash your hands. But you didn't wash your hands. Your, 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 your disciples, they, they didn't wash their hands when they ate. It's, it's fascinating to me how, how sometimes elitist can focus on the, the smallest thing, the most insignificant thing. Well, what about this? Focus on the flag. We don't focus on lies. It, it, the Bible says the washing that they did, it wasn't because their hands were dirty. It was a ceremonial washing. But, but let's turn a blind eye to someone being converted. You see,
see, because it, it would have been nice. Wouldn't it have been nice if these people would have decided, let's partner with this guy? And, 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 as, and as little Bill and as little John, as these guys get up from, from never being able to walk again or, or seeing when they were blind from birth or anything like that, it'd be nice to have someone there to talk to them about God and the God who heals them and the God who saves them. But instead, those who were most equipped to talk about God, what about those hand washing? What about those, you know, the, you know they, they didn't wash their hands. I, I, I can't really get with the program because they didn't quite wash their hands right. than it is to invite someone over to have lunch with you or to pray with someone or to have a Bible study. It's easier to say, well, well, that church, I mean, but, but they, they, they don't wash their hands. It's easier to focus on, on, on something very, very small. But when lives are being touched, we turn a blind eye. When homes are being transformed, we not only turn a blind eye, we don't even we don't even help. We don't even get with the program, even if it wasn't us who did it. I mean, we could still they could have still got with the program. They chose to just focus on the hand washing. The problem was their tradition, and I think, as I stated from the outset, I think traditions are good. But their problem.
naturally, it, it's also believed that he also said, if your son bring a fish. So I might say, my donkey, yeah, I can, I can go without the donkey for a day, but man, if my child. Now I gotta pull my hand out and leave the rock in my pocket. Be, be, because, because the question was, like, like, what would you do if your son were in a ditch on the Sabbath? It seems like a no-brainer. We sit here today and we think it's a no-brainer, but I guarantee you, if you've been an Adventist long enough, you've had something happen on the Sabbath, and you've sat there, Linda, and you've questioned, should I do it there for the church? If, I, if, if, I, if they catch me at the gas station, if they catch me at the gas station, is someone going to wonder, why didn't you fill up? Why didn't you take notice? I was driving with someone. I'm not going to say who. We were going to a, uh, a camp meeting. And I didn't know we were going to camp meeting that day. And, and, and I just came to church, and all of a sudden it was like, let's go to camp meeting. And we're driving in my car. And I didn't have gas to get to camp meeting. I didn't have that kind of gas. And I'm like, oh, Lord. Now, they can't see the, they can't see the, the gas thing, right? I can see it clearly. I knew from the minute he said, let's go to camp meeting, it was a good idea. Victory Lake is, it's, it's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> you don't want to be stranded on that, that back road. It's not a highway. Finally, the man, thank you, brother. But our traditions sometimes hold us captive. Traditions hold us captive. And, and that's just sort of a lighthearted thing. Sabbath school lessons aren't taught by angels from heaven, although they very angelic, aren't they? They, they are very angelic people. You know, church is a, is a, is a, is a place that, I mean, if, if, you want, if you want a church that has, has good, godly traditions, that, that's on us. That's not on, that's not on them. That's on us. That's on me. If I say I want the church to be loving, if I, I went to a church that I, for a little bit of time, and I didn't feel welcome, I didn't feel welcome, and I thought 
to myself, well, I, I want to be in a church that's welcoming. So if I come to the joy of Troy and I want to be in a church that's welcoming, how do I have to treat someone who I haven't seen before? Do I just assume the angels will welcome that man when he comes in? The angels will welcome that sister when she comes in. Oh, when they're sitting by themselves at potluck, an angel will go and sit next to them and talk to them about their day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our maker, our creator. 